Hello, everyone. Good evening and welcome to, the, to this evening's session in conversation with. So um, before we kick off, a few quick domestics to run through with you. And while that's coming up on screen, I'll just introduce myself. My name is Ruth McCarthy. I'm a peer support pharmacist here with the IIOP. And in my day job, I work in the School of Pharmacy in UCC. So this evening, we're going to be in conversation talking about burnout amongst pharmacists. And we're going to be looking at around the research angle of that. So um, you can go on there, Grace. Thanks. Um, it will be recorded. So just to let you know that if you could please ensure all your microphones are on mute unless you're um, contributing to the panel discussion later. Um, you can have your video on and off, whatever works for you. But if you're having any connectivity issues, please just pop your video off. If you've any difficulty with the sound, um, just double check your speaker is on. It's not muted and turn down or, or turn down on your um, laptop. Or if this is not working, just log out and log back in again. If you do have any questions, please pop them in the chat box and I'll come around to them later during the panel discussion. Um, and just to let you know, we may possibly use some anonymized information from this webinar. So to kick off, we have a lovely format this evening to talk on this discussion with you. So first of all, Jody D is going to talk to us about the global picture of what's happening with pharmacist burnout. Then Dr. Katrina Bradley is going to drill down into our setting and our community of practice here in Ireland. And then Dr. Mary Collins is going to look at, so we've heard all this, what do we do now? So she's going to guide us through that and give us some tools in for our toolbox to guide us through that. So we will commence first with Jodi. Um, and Jodi did a systematic review with um, in RCSI with John Hayden, and she looked at the international context and setting to see what pharmacist burnout looked like in that setting. So Jodi is a newly registered pharmacist, um, has joined our register in, in recent months, and therefore she is um, looking at it from that perspective. She also worked for many years as a technician, so she does come to things with a slightly different lens and can see things from a different perspective. So at this point, I'm going to pass over to Jodi. Thank you, Ruth. So I thought I would start off by talking about what exactly burnout is. So this is the World Health Organization definition. They uh, define it as the psychological response to ineffectively managed work-related stress. Um, it is considered an occupational or work-related phenomenon, but it's not considered a medical condition. Um, what burnout typically looks like, um, people often present with symptoms such as emotional exhaustion, having an increased feeling of of depersonalization or cynicism and a reduced feeling of personal accomplishment or efficacy at work. So when we look at the research, burnout is high among healthcare professionals and has been studied in doctors and nurses, um, but up to now hasn't been particularly well characterized in pharmacists. So there is a big impact to burnout. Um, it can result in reduced productivity at work, people feel that they don't perform their duties as well as they could. It does result in increased job turnout, turnover. Uh, those that are experiencing burnout are far more likely to leave their current employment and even leave the profession altogether. Um, it does result in reduced well-being, both physical and psychological. And very importantly, it, never, it has the potential to negatively impact the quality of patient care as well. So just a quick recap on what a systematic review is. Basically, I went and trawled through all the databases and found every single observational study that I could find that looked at burnout in pharmacists. I critiqued them all and selected articles that were eligible based on my inclusion criteria. And then I took all of the numbers from all of those studies. There was 19 included in the end. And then I pulled all that data together so that it would answer my research question, which was what exactly is the prevalence of burnout in pharmacists and what are the associated risk factors with burnout too? So in my results, I found that over half of pharmacists were experiencing burnout, 51% specifically, although there was quite a big range from as low as 5% up as high as 75%. Um, it did say that those that were experiencing burnout were more likely to have made a medication error and also consider leaving their current employment or leaving the profession. There were some risk factors that were associated with a higher risk of burnout, 
And these are some of the most popular ones that cropped up in the research, which were working full time, having less professional experience, being newly qualified or a younger age, and um, having very high prescription volumes and high workload, poor work life balance, and excessive administrative duties such as paperwork. There were also factors that I found that seemed to have um, a protective effect or a lower associated risk of burnout, which included time away from work, participation in education and training programs, whether that was having a pharmacy student or doing peer to peer training. Um, having frequent social interactions and hobbies was very important and access to burnout management resources. However, none of the studies actually went into any detail as to what those resources were. So what I kind of took from my review was looking at what would have to change in order for burnout levels to come down or to prevent it. So organizational structure and work culture seems to be very important, especially as globally a pharmacist's scope of practice is expanding, meaning our workload is potentially increasing. Um, the actual physical working environment is really important and workflow and processes all kind of help around stress and workload at work. Um, the team support, having a good team around you seems to be really important and even more basic, having a, an adequate amount of staff around um, is super important to our workload. And then the individual supports available for those that feel they are burnt out or feel they are at risk of being burnt out and what they can access to help that. So that is a little whistle stop, store, whistle stop tour of the global picture of burnout in pharmacists. Thank you so much, Jodi. That's really insightful um, and you condensed it very nicely for us. But can I ask you, as a young pharmacist, what brought you to this topic? So this was a topic that was suggested by my supervisor during um, my final year in pharmacy. Um, it was something that he had been looking at and I thought that it was quite an interesting topic. Um, so just kind of jumped on it and definitely found it more interesting as I investigated it. And I definitely kind of in hindsight can almost remember my own personal experiences of, as a technician that I went, God, there were times when I was quite burnt out as well. And I, you know, I kind of felt this way. So I definitely kind of think it's just something that's very relevant and not talked about enough, which really kind of inspired me to, to keep on going with it. Super. Thank you so much, Jodie. So now we're going to look at our own environment and our own um, practice setting here in Ireland. And for that, we have Dr. Katrina Bradley. And Katrina is the pharmacist. Um, she currently works as the executive director of the Art Institute of Pharmacy, which is also a qualified personal and executive coach. And she recently completed a HDIP in psychology. And it was part of that HDIP that took her to do a study on burnout and pharmacists here in Ireland. So tonight, she's kindly going to share the results of that research with us. So over to you, Katrina. Thanks very much, Ruth. And it's lovely to be here on this side as a contributor to the webinars. Um, and as Ruth said, you know, I, I do work in the Institute, but the work that I undertook here was as, as part of a student project, much like Jodie. Um, so I've been undertaking for the past number of years, um, a HDIP, a conversion degree in psychology in Dublin Business School. And my final year project was looking at burnout in pharmacy and, and considering some of the psychological aspects um, in line with the, the psychology um, qualification. And that was because, you know, we were here Hearing more and more about burnout during COVID and post COVID, but actually there was conversation about many of the factors that are um, causing burnout were already there before COVID. And it's just that pressure point kind of caused people to really get burnt out. So um, when we looked at it, you'll see from Jody's study that there's many workplace issues that um, impact on um, burnout. And they weren't really considered so much here because the workplace issues were being considered at the same time in the PSI Future Pharmacy Workforce Study. Um, so my uh, survey came out at a very similar time to that. Um, and so what I focused on in my research was, well, what are the burnout scores? Because we didn't have any measure. As Jody said, it's not really measured much in pharmacy. Um, and then what were some of the uh, demographic factors and also psychological aspects that might be impacting on that? So delighted to, to share it. Um, as 
this looks like a busy slide and there's just one real takeaway. As, as Jody said, these measures of burnout, um, there's there's a few of them, but you need to use a validated um, instrument. So um, I know that we would previously have asked in the Institute, you know, if how people were feeling and, and people would have said to us, oh, I feel burnt out. But actually, if you're going to measure burnout and get a, a measure for the profession, you need to use one of these validated instruments and it can be Maslock or Oldenburg. Um, I use the Copenhagen Burnout Infantry and really that was just looking at personal work and patient related burnout. Now, these are tools that you need to use kind of strategically in combination with other information. So no pharmacist can really sit down, get a score, and, and that doesn't necessarily tell them very much on an individual level. But what these tools are designed to do really is look at um, how you can build engagement and establish healthier workplaces for employees where they'll thrive. Um, and when you do a study like this, it's always important. And I, I felt very strongly that it's um, when you go out and ask people to return um, responses to a survey on how they're feeling. It's important to share that information back with them. And so I'm delighted to be able to do that in this forum this evening so that if any of you um, listening this evening were involved in responding to the, the survey, um, it's good for you to, to see what the results of those were. So back in January, people may have seen um, and many of them may have responded to this um, survey on burnout amongst pharmacists. And there was 6,030 pharmacists who were um, involved in responding to it. And those were essentially people who were willing to be contacted on the PSI research uh, register for research purposes. Um, 868 responses um, were received. And I'd like to thank every pharmacist that contributed to it. Um, the that was about 14% of the, the people that we surveyed and very much the, the characteristics of the profession, predominantly female, so 70% female, 29% male, 1% non-binary. Um, in terms of where they were practicing, the majority were practicing community with 14% in hospital and 8% in other, which would be academia and regulatory affairs. Um, and there was 14% of pharmacists working across multiple areas. Um, and it was harder to identify um, for, their, for them where burnout might be coming from because it wasn't easy to know which workplace they would be referring to. Um, in terms of the employment types, 40% of the pharmacists who responded were employees. And then we had um, supervising pharmacists or chief two level or, or senior manager manager level pharmacists. And then 7% were superintendent um, and or chief one. And then owners um, other, made up uh, some of the other people. So the employment is, is very much, um, I think, reflective of what we would see in the profession more generally. Now, the result, the mean burnout score of 54.93, as I said earlier, means relatively little. What you're really looking for are the trends and, and the other data that um, responds to that. So if we were looking at um, burnout levels in the profession, um, what I would say is that sorry, my, um, over 62% of pharmacists in this study were identified as experiencing medium or high levels of burnout. So that's quite high. Um, if we look at the pooled prevalence that Jody talked about, she said over half, maybe 51, 52%. Um, so we've 62% in this study. But as Jody said, there's other pharmacy studies internationally where it's up as far as 75%. And I would say this is pretty much in line with other healthcare workers in and, and other studies in Ireland. Um, so looking at what are the factors that seem to impact on burnout. So we correspond, looked at the burnout scores and then looked at how that changed with age, with practice area, with employment type and, and with working hours. So with age, this looks again like a busy slide, but what we have on the, the left hand column is the age categories. So starting with under 25, then 25 to 35, 36 to 45, 46 to 55 and so on. And then we have at the top the scores. So CBI is your Copenhagen burnout inventory and we have the overall score and then those three subscores we talked about, the personal burnout, the work related burnout and patient related burnout. So um, the 25 to 35 age range had significantly higher burnout rates than those who were kind of over 46. Um, and you can see that this is followed quite closely by the uh, 36 to 45. So I think it's safe to say that this demographic of people between 25 and 45 definitely have the highest level of burnout. And you can see that across the personal scores. So they've significantly higher personal burnout scores um, than other areas. So this is things about their own personal health and psychologically they have a lot going on in their life at this time, um, starting careers, starting families, um, 
buying houses. So that would tie into the, the personal score. Um, and then the work related subscore is really related to the work that they do. And the patient related subscore is around the, the burnout that they receive, that compassionate burnout and the, the burnout associated with patients. So um, I think this is important to know if you're in that demographic and um, that you're, you seem to be that that group seem to be at a higher risk. Um, and also if you have these people working for you. And I know Mary is going to talk about the impact of generations or if she doesn't in her presentation, certainly I know that she has done a lot of work on the generational impacts of, of things. So I think that's something that's worth a discussion about how we look at that generational aspect of burnout. In terms of practice area, um, the highest level of burnout was within community pharmacists and they were significantly higher than those in other areas like hospital or other um, or people working in multiple areas. And similarly, um, those in hospital, they also had higher burnout scores than people working in other areas, but they did have lower burnout scores than community pharmacists. In terms of employment type, so we looked at, as I said earlier, there was employees, there was supervising or chief two, uh, superintendent or chief one in the hospital setting or owners, and then self-employed people and people working across multiple employments. And what we saw here is owners were of um, pharmacies um, or businesses were the, the number one category for burnout, and this was significantly higher than everywhere else, um, all the other categories, but also supervising pharmacists. So they're the two categories, and this is something that we, you know, we talk about a lot in terms of Irish um, demographics, but we wouldn't have had that on before. So now we have scores and we know um, where the highest levels of burnout are. And certainly between those two um, categories, we can see the highest levels of burnout. Working hours, and Jody spoke about this, working hours generally do increase burnout. Um, if somebody's working full time, they're more likely to experience burnout. There was a trend for sure that the longer hours you work, the more that you saw burnout scores increasing, but it wasn't hugely significant. Um, and that maybe leads on to some of the subsequent points that I'm going to talk about. Um, so it's not so much the quantity of work, but also the, the quality of the workplace and, and how people are, are feeling and, and how they're able to cope with it. So the psychological factors that we looked at, there was three. And psychological safety is to do with the team that you work in and the workplace and the culture that you're in. Psychological capital, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about each of these, is about your own personal um, abilities and, and, and states of optimism, and, and we'll elaborate on that. And then job crafting is how you manage the job and, and increase the resources and decrease the demands on the jobs that you have. So looking very briefly at these three, psychological safety, that's really a shared belief amongst colleagues as to whether it's safe to engage in interpersonal risk taking. And when I say interpersonal risk taking, it's that in behavior in the workplace, such as engaging in open communication, being able to voice your concerns, being able to have healthy debate, seeking feedback. And um, Amy Edmondson identified this as a really important area in work-life balance and in high-performing teams and Google have adapted it and identified it as one of the main contributors to highly effective teams but it's impacted not just by the individual behaviors but by the organizational culture and by the um, the leader the team and the individual behaviors so everybody has a role in the culture and the psychological safety that you have and psychological safety scores were really significant in predicting burnout so those pharmacists who worked in areas with low psychological safety were much more um, likely to have higher burnout scores and so that gives us something to think about in terms of our, our workplaces and and how we contribute to that team dynamic that we're all working in psychological capital is a slightly is it's a different concept and this is about the individual themselves so this was developed by Fred Luthens and um, colleagues and really this is there's four different parts to psychological capital this is how e efficacious or how how much I feel able to to do my job and do things and um, the resilience that I have in doing it the optimism and the hope that I feel and the reason that they include these four is that they can all be measured and they can all be changed and Mary is is uh, the perfect person to have on the webinar tonight because I know when I've presented this research before people have said okay well so what um, and so it is important to think about what can you do about these particular aspects and what the study in Irish pharmacists showed was that 
hope and optimism scores were predictive of burnout. So if you had low hope or low optimism, you were more likely to be suffering from burnout. Um, interestingly, resilience and efficacy, so training and ability to do the job, they didn't seem to be connected with burnout. And um, an international researcher, um, Zubin Austin, has talked about this before, and he talked about the idea that you can be a really resilient person, but if you work in an environment that isn't particularly supportive or is toxic, it actually is going to impact your well-being. And the converse is true too. You mightn't have a huge amount of resilience, but if you have good support around you, it tends to be quite protective against um, burnout and to help your well-being. So the final one is job crafting. And this was um, job crafting for anybody who mightn't have heard about it. This is where people can make changes in their own job and change the demands and the resources to optimize their own personal work goals. Um, so job demands might be the work pressure, the um, cognitive load, the operational infrastructure, how you have to do your job. And then your job resources are, you know, the support that you have, the team that you have, the feedback, the leadership, your own resources. Um, and so what we have seen a lot is um, this emerging trend of job crafting. So people actually finding how they can reduce the demands within their workplace, um, reorganizing their work, reorientating their team, thinking differently about their workflow, um, and also the job resources. So what can they bring to it or what can they use? So low, low job crafting was a predictor of burnout. So if somebody has more control over the job and is able to use the resources that are available and reduce the demands and, and kind of craft their job themselves uh, within the confines of what they have to do, they're less likely to, um, to be suffering from burnout. But the one caveat with that is it's not an independent predictor. So what we see is this relationship between if you've got high job crafting, an ability to, um, for somebody to, to look at their job and, and modify it, then you're also likely to work in a place that has good psychological capital and a good psychological safety and you're you know you've got good reserves of optimism and uh, positivity and resilience so I suppose much like jo uh, Jody had said what does this tell us well I think we can say that burnout is an issue in Irish pharmacy some people might be saying well whoop de do we already knew that but at least we have the data um, and it always helps to kind of be able to articulate that in a very objective way we can see that there are certain parts of the profession that have higher levels of burnout so particularly 25 to 35 years of age and 36 to 45 um, community pharmacists owners and supervising pharmacists are the ones who have demonstrated the high highest levels of burnout. Um, we can see that psychological safety is a protective factor, that if you have that psychological uh, safety in the team, you're less likely, significantly less likely to have um, or to suffer from burnout. And hope and optimism, they sound like they're very ethereal things, but they're actually quite um, objective. And Mary will be able to talk about that. In the, but they play a really important role. Now, the one thing this study doesn't tell us is, that, is that hope and optimism at a personal level or organizational level or professional level. So there's still more information. And you know, this study doesn't solve everything by any stretch of the imagination. It provides us with a measure. It gives us some insights, but there's lots more to talk about. And I think it'll be really interesting to hear uh, Mary's observation and the panel discussion uh, from the contributors tonight as well. So thank you, Ruth. Thank you so much, Katrina. Can I just ask when you were forming your research question, what drew you to this particular topic? Oh, well, I think partly it was the subject that I was studying, but also um, I think it's been long documented that, you know, hours and prescription volume and those sorts of things um, impact on study. But I did think sometimes it is um, those things that are harder to put your, your finger on, like hope, like optimism, um, like those psychological factors. And they aren't really, if you look at big corporate studies, people invest a lot of money and time in doing this for their workforce if they work in large organizations that's not something that we necessarily have the luxury of doing in pharmacy and so it was to provide an insight and to see well do these affect smaller organizations or pharmacy um, and to, to just provide shine a light on the fact that these issues are important in in pharmacy too thank you so much katrina you're very kind thank you for your contribution 
So next we're going to move over to Dr. Mary Collins and Mary is a charter psychologist and a senior uh, coach practitioner. She actually works in RCSI in the Centre for Positive Health Science and she has worked in the leadership and talent development for over 20 years. So she's very passionate about this idea of people flourishing in their workplaces and in, within their work lives. She's also writing a book at the moment on emotional intelligence, uh, intelligence and dentistry, which we will hopefully see in this coming spring, a spring of 2024. So well done, Mary, on that. So I'll pass over to you and uh, we look forward to your talk. Thanks so much, Ruth. Um, and it is just wonderful to be back with um, IIOP. So thank you everyone for being here this evening. As I said to Katrina, we always seem to be competing with the, the glorious weather. And I'm looking at Jeff O'Connor enviously. Um, it looks absolutely stunning wherever you are, Jeff. But um, great to be back with everyone. And can I just recognize um, the wonderful research we've heard from Jody and Katrina? Um, it's just fantastic, I think, to get data, um, particularly on the Irish context. So we hear so much about these international studies, but I think it is wonderful to have this, this up-to-date uh, research and data. So, so thank you both for sharing that. Um, so just very briefly, um, as, as Ruth said, I am a chartered coaching psychologist and I've spent most of my working life um, working in the area of creating positive workplace cultures. And I'd like to share in the presentation tonight, really just briefly touch on three key areas. What are those factors that make a positive workplace culture? Um, Secondly, let's do a deep dive into optimism. Katrina mentioned the importance of optimism and hope. So what exactly is that? And thirdly, and importantly, three practical actions that I'd like everyone just to reflect on. And if there's even one action you can take from this um, short presentation, that, that would be wonderful. So yeah, just to get started on, I wanted to talk a little bit about stress in the workplace. And we always tend to think of this in a very negative light. This is the Yerkes Dobson law from 1908 actually. And like most good um, theories, it's been repackaged and developed, but it's still as relevant as ever. And the, important, uh, the importance of having eustress, so E-U-S-T or E-S-S, -S, is that healthy stress or adrenaline that we actually need to perform, to be motivated and to function well. Um, what we don't want is for that to tip over into distress. And that is when we are heading towards burnout, we're anxious, we're depressed, we're negative, we're demotivated. But equally, we don't want to tip it the other way into boredom. And I'm seeing in a lot of my work at the moment, people are rusting out. So not burning out, but rusting out where they're just bored. And that can be equally um, as detrimental to, to our development in the workplace. So we want to stay in that healthy stress zone where we have the supports around us, where we're being challenged, where we're achieving, we're growing and developing. Um, and, and that's really important to stay there. Okay, so there's many different frameworks. And if I can do a little shameless plug, I'm um, developing a master's at the moment in RCSI on leading health and well-being at work. And that's going to be launched next spring because there is a huge demand cross-sectorally for people to, to really develop the skills. How do I actually create a positive culture at work? And this is not about very well-intentioned yoga classes or, um, you know, um, menopause breakfast talks or whatever it might be, which are, again, very well-intentioned, but they're just events. They're just interventions. We really need to focus on creating a positive workplace culture where, as Katrina mentioned, where we have psychological safety, people have agency over their psychological capital. Um, and it is a place where people can thrive and flourish. So there's four key factors in a healthy place to work. And this is just one framework I've uh, selected from the Healthy Place to Work organization. And it's grounded in significant research. And the important thing is that people are, you know, there's a focus on physical health. 
so that's you know that the work is is a, a safe place to be the workplace is a safe place to be that we have proper breaks etc we have a, a a safe work environment that's our physical workspace but then we get into the three higher order areas so we have to have purpose in our work and Katrina and I have had many conversations about that. this, that I think in pharmacy, you know, that there's such a very clear purpose in the work you do. And, you know, working with patients, with customers and delivering, you know, a wonderful service in the most challenging times for many people in their lives. So that sense of, you know, purpose and meaning in work and a congruence with your values and the values of the workplace. Then we have that sense of connection. The number one human need in the workplace is the human need to bond and connect. And Anne, I was quite taken by your comment in the chat box because absolutely that social connection and work is so, so key. And I would encourage you, those of you particularly who are supervisors or owners um, who are leading teams to ensure that there is a a framework there where people can connect, that there is space created for people to have those social connections in the workplace, which is particularly difficult at the moment. Um, we'll talk about the younger generations, but I have heard many, many times in recent months that at break times, people are just on their phones. Are you finding that? That, you know, people are not actually having that connection and conversation. Um, so that's that's one big challenge. But having that sense of inclusion as well, that people are respected and included, uh, regardless of, you know, age, sexual orientation, all of the equality grounds. Um, and that that sense of support is there from managers, that people feel supported. Moving on then to mental resilience, that people feel they are, they have that mental and emotional support, that they are learning, they're achieving, they're developing themselves in the workplace, that there is financial well-being, that is a significant issue at the moment in many different sectors, um, and that there is efficacy around job and career, but also around personal health options. So that's just one model. And again, I've, I've the reference on the slides and everyone is welcome to the slides after. If you'd like to read more into any of those particular areas of creating a healthy place to work. So moving on then to talk a little bit about optimism. And the, some of you may recognize this slide from the very first webinar I ever did with the IIOP. I just checked the date of it before we came on. It was the 26th of March, 2021. Who remembers that? We were in the depths, the dark, dark days of the pandemic. Um, and I have to say, IIOP were the first ones out of the traps doing webinars. And I think other people were struggling with what is this Zoom thing? And you guys really were, um, I think, one of the first to set up this um, brilliant webinar series. So we talked then about the importance of optimism. And I think now more than ever, it's really important. Optimism is like a muscle. And I think it's one that we continuously need to develop. We are hardwired to focus on the negative. We all have a negativity bias. It's quite a primal, a protective measure that we will focus on the negative. But we can really change and work on developing a focus on the positives. So a simple, um, a simple example of that, if you are working and say you've had a really negative complaint or a negative encounter with a patient or a customer, that will tend to stay in our minds. But let's not forget the five other positive experiences and the positive feedback we've received and actually take time to savor and absorb that and appreciate that. So optimism comes from the Latin word optimus, meaning best. And an optimistic person is always looking for the best in any situation. So it's about sensing that opportunity, even in the darkest days, you know, what is good about this situation? What learning can I take? What can I bring forward to improve things into the future? So it is about seeing the big picture and it's about bouncing back from defeat. So really building up those reserves within us. 
in terms of the language and um, I find this can be helpful to be aware of the explanatory styles of positive psychology. So the optimist in, an, in a challenging situation, their mindset is, this is temporary, this will pass. This is local. It relates to one situation. It's not personal, so taking a more objective view of it. And it is controllable. What can I do about this situation? So again, if you find, if some of you listening or on the call tonight find you're more naturally drawn to the pessimistic side, you can actually work on developing a more optimistic approach and watch the language you, you use is very important. So just moving into three key practical actions to develop that hope and optimism that it came through so strongly in Katrina's findings that this is a very protective measure to protect all of us uh, from burnout. And remember, burnout can creep up on you. And it's really important to be self-aware and to check in with ourselves. You know, how is our burnout? And there are great measures out there now. We've heard a few of them this evening. Um, we would, we with our scholars in the Center for Positive Health Sciences, we recommend the Maslach Inventory. And we would suggest people take that every six months or so, just to, again, have a measure and check in on their own burnout levels. So the first action is developing your own personal toolkit. Um, there are many things outside of our sphere of control. And if we go back to Stephen Covey's work, you know, what's within your sphere of control and what's outside of it? And, you know, there's no point stressing and ruminating about the things that we actually can't control. But we can control our personal behaviours and develop our personal toolkit. And I'd like to just invite everybody now to look at these four core strategies and to pick just one thing from each of these boxes, um, one habit to build into your daily practice. So the first one is all about centering techniques. So for some of us, mindfulness is wonderful, meditation, other people run a mile from it. <laughs> but mindfulness uh, for somebody could be going for a really nice walk in nature. It's just all about being present, um, finding good breathing techniques that work for you in stressful situations. The second is expressive creative strategies. So that can be through art, through conscious exercise, through working on a project. And I just want to talk to conscious exercise for a moment. That is not having listening to a podcast on a treadmill with Sky News on in front and having your phone beside you. <laughs> that is not conscious exercise. So it's all again about just being centered and really doing that movement um, in a conscious way. Reflection and exploration strategies. Again, the art of reflection is a dying skill. And I would encourage all of you, if you don't already, to journal. Some people really like journaling. Um, Self-monitoring would be where the Maslach inventory would come in, that sort of checking in with yourself or just communicating. Um, and healthy lifestyles. Now, listen, I know we all know what we should be doing on the healthy lifestyle measures, but we talk in psychology about the action fallacy <laughs> or the knowing doing gap but if you can even focus on more hydration during the day or you know eating trying to get more vegetables into your diet so just again small habits to build so these are sort of daily practices just pick one that's practical that can work for you in your busy uh, personal and professional lives we know that all of these have an evidence base behind them as well OK, um, let's move on. I think the importance of showing gratitude to our colleagues, um, showing gratitude to our patients, our customers, and again, just being appreciating what was good, even in the toughest days. And those of you who were at the first webinar we did will know about the three good things study just before bedtime. So again, that's a very nice practice to get into. Um, and the link is there if you'd like to read more about that particular one. And then finally, um, 
the, the third action is around really engaging in your strengths. Um, there is a an excellent tool if you're not if you don't know what your signature strengths are. It's a free profile viacharacter.org that again, um, you can log on and complete for yourself and make sure that you do engage with those strengths because we know when we do uh, focus on our strengths on a daily basis, we do have greater happiness, greater mental and physical health. So um, that's it for me, a few resources there for you, but I hope that's provoked even one or two ideas as to how you can personally develop hope and optimism. Thank you so much, Mary. That's an excellent talk and, and lots of ideas there that we can ruminate over. Um, could I ask you, you mentioned earlier in your talk the idea of that sphere of control piece. Would you mind exploring that a little bit further for us? Yes. So, I mean, I work, um, I work, I have my own business psychology practice as well as working part time in RCSI. So I'm working across sectors at the moment. And there is a lot of anxiety out there. Um, I think burnout is, is certainly, we're seeing a lot more elevated levels of burnout across the board. I think people are still processing what happened in the pandemic as well. And what we're finding is the lots, there's lots of toxic behaviors in the workplace. So with a lot of things going on um, out of our control, the sphere of control is what within my remit. So can I go to bed earlier? Can I get better sleep? Can I make sure that I get out for a 10 minute walk at lunchtime? So what is within my personal control throughout my day? And what, what small habits and routines can I build in to improve my personal levels of well-being? Super, thank you for that. Okay, so we're going to have our panel discussion where everyone can join in basically. So if you have a question, feel free to raise your hand and put it straight to the panel yourself. Um, or you can pop it in the chat box and I will um, bring it to the panel. Um, in the interim, I might just jump on you, Jody, if you don't mind. Um, I suppose now that you're, you know, in practice, um, and you have this knowledge that you've gained through your research, how does it feel in practice? How does it actually fit with your experience of being a pharmacist? Um, I think in practice, it can be it can be very difficult, and I suppose that depends on the pharmacy that you're in. I've worked in places that are very burnout centric where they're very very busy and you don't have a lot of support and you don't get time to take a break um and I feel like that's unfortunately very common um so there are certain places that definitely are easier to work in but I think overall the kind of the the work culture and the attitude is is very it's it's it doesn't really kind of take into into account that that burnout could be a problem it's like it's not really on the radar in the way that we work right now okay very good um there's a question here from sean um i'm not sure if katrina or mary's best answered but uh maybe katrina from the research you did when you were uh looking at your research i might go to you first and then go to mary from her perspective were there any studies specifically that you came across from other healthcare professionals that would indicate are we the norm or are other healthcare professionals the same with are we different? Um, I'm happy to to take it first. I, I, as a pharmacist coming to it, was kind of going, oh, you know, it's terrible in pharmacy and it's so much worse. It, it isn't necessarily, not when you compare with other healthcare professions. Um, the, the study that I did, and like I say, it's just one study, but um, I do think this is a, a, a problem across the healthcare professions. And I think Mary might be better able to, to speak to that. I do think there's some comments in the um, chat room, though, that mm. are specific to pharmacy that are yeah. worth talking about. And, and that's some mm -hmm. of the, the, the working kind of conditions. But um, yeah, to, to, to my mind, um, particularly with medicine, nursing and hospitals, a lot of very similar type uh, levels of burnout. Mary, I don't know if you'd have a, a view on that. Yes, agree. I think we are seeing um, increased levels of burnout across all 
health professions. In, but I do think there is a generational lens to this as well. And in line with Katrina's study, you know, the 25 to 35 year olds that experienced the highest levels of burnout in your study, Katrina, we're certainly seeing that mirrored across different sectors as well. So the youngest generation um, in the workplace, Centennials or Gen Z, are experiencing significantly poorer mental health than other generations in the workplace. So I do think age has is a factor here as well. And Mary, could I ask you have a question of why is that or have you any insight into why that is? Yes, and I'm actually just about to embark. We've just got ethical approval for a study um, in the National Maternity Hospital with young midwives because again, nursing and midwifery are experiencing very high levels of attrition at the moment. So we are doing, we're going to be getting some, um, some good data on that later this year. But we do know, um, Ruth, it's so complex, but certainly I think uh, technology has played a key role in the upbringing of the youngest generation. Um, so we are seeing a lot of anxiety, stress and depression linked to the use of technology, but also parenting um, has had a significant role in that um, a lot of the younger generation are being brought up in a world where they're very scaffolded, a lot of helicopter parenting. And the emotional intelligence research is telling us they're scoring significantly lower on three scales on autonomy or independence, problem solving and stress tolerance. So their levels of their ability to deal with stress is significantly lower than previous generations. Okay, that's interesting. Mm. I'm gonna bring us back to the chat here and Keith has put in a comment there that while your tools sound fantastic, <laughs> uh, not a chance. So how do we take the tools you have and bring them realistically into very busy, high pressured environments and make them stick. Yeah, Keith, I mean, it's a really it's a really good point. And it goes back to, you know, the physical was like it's almost like Maslow's hierarchy. It's your, you know, the basic needs. You hardly have time to eat. <laughs> Um, so again, there, you know, that's your sort of the hygiene factor, the basic human needs need to be met before we can focus on developing hope and optimism and all of these other things. Um, so again, I think it's about creating the really the small changes and that can be, you know, in terms of your morning routine, your night routine, any small changes you can build in. But I would say as a profession, you know, if people are not having time to eat or have breaks, um, that's, you know, something that needs to be looked at. I don't know, Katrina, from a sort of pharmacy perspective, what are your thoughts on that one? Yeah, well, I'm interested to hear Jodie because she will um, see that firsthand. But um, I think it, it does come back to psychological safety. It, it's not easy, but, you know, being able to make the time for breaks and treating your staff in, in a way that they have that. But also as a pharmacist, making sure you take your breaks. I, I know that we can be guilty sometimes of having the time to, to, to have a break and, and not taking it. Um, so it's it's an understanding that these things are important and somebody put into the chat that as pharmacists we tend to, to put everybody else first and wait until things get bad enough to, to do something and actually understanding that this is important stuff that needs to be tended to that it you know you need to think about your physical your mental your you know your different resources and um I, I think it is beholden upon us as professionals and because of the the nature of the work that we do we need to look after these these topics, even if it is really, really difficult. Um, Jodi, you probably have a sense of seeing different workplaces and, and how it is as a pharmacist practicing in, in these. Um, what's your sense of it? Yeah, absolutely. would absolutely agree with what's mentioned in the comments that you can be in places where you don't get to take a break, whether it's to eat or just to take a, a mental break to just kind of clear your head for a minute. Um, Personally, because I've done this type of research, I care very much about my breaks. I know I know myself that I'm not able to do my job unless I do that. So I will always make sure that I get, you know, time to sit down and take one. 
Um, I do provide regular cover in a pharmacy that does something really nice, which I think is a good practical tip for everybody, is that they put their phones on answer a machine at 1 p.m., just saying the pharmacist is on lunch. They don't take any calls. They don't take any prescription requests and they just get their lunch completely uninterrupted. And I've only found this one place that does it. And I actually think it's a really simple, practical way to ensure that a pharmacist gets a break, that they can just take a little bit of time to themselves, whether it's to eat or just rest their mind for a minute. Thanks very much, Jody. I, I put a question maybe to you, Mary, here. So Kira's made a comment about maybe it's the younger generation's ability to say no to this constant stress. Um, maybe that's the difference between them and the previous generations. And what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's really interesting, Kira. And I do certainly see the younger generations are just not going to tolerate uh, workplace cultures where they don't feel valued, they don't feel respected. Um, and that's why we're seeing a mass exodus in, in healthcare overall. And that's one of the reasons I'm doing this midwifery study. Um, and, you know, it's at the same time, and I do think that's the positive change, the younger generations are very boundaried around work and life. And I think that's a really positive thing and we need more of that actually. Um, however, we're also seeing the highest levels of depression, stress and anxiety. And if you look at our psychiatric hospitals, um, you know, there's huge, it's, it's the younger generations where, where the, the, the significant demand is. Um, a recent study this year looking at mental health, physical health, social health and spiritual health in Europe. Uh, the youngest generation, Gen Z, were, had five times poorer mental health than baby boomers. The only, the only scale they, they were not the lowest was on physical health, actually. So socially, we know they're the loneliest generation as well. I think loneliness is a huge, huge factor in all of this. That lack of, of really meaningful social connection is, is at play here as well. It's interesting. And Jodie, sorry to pick on you again. <laughs> uh, you, you are in the community setting versus myself and Katrina, and therefore you um, have a, a different perspective on things. But could I ask you, just in mind of what everyone has mentioned, as a young pharmacist, like when you are looking for a pharmacist role, what is it that you're looking for? What is it, you know, what appeals to you? What ignites your fire when you're looking at a, a role? Um, I definitely care very much about my work-life balance I think that's something that's that's really important for me personally that I know that I need to have time off work and that it needs to be easy and straightforward to take time off work I care very much about the physical environment as well you know cramped messy dispensaries stress me out <laughs> I can't I need somewhere that's lovely and tidy and organized and has lots of space I'm finding some dispensaries just very small um and then Something that is probably less practical because this is something that lots of community pharmacies will experience is um, staff. There's a lot of places that are unfortunately very, very short staffed, trying to have an, an adequate amount of people that can share your workload, that you can delegate, um, that, you know, we can all kind of share it is, is really important. Um, and I that's probably the most difficult part to find. Um, but those are the kind of things certainly that, that I that I look for now when um, I am looking for work. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Siobhan has posed a question here. Oh, sorry, I clicked on the wrong thing. Um, and she's wondering, um, maybe Katrina or Judy in the research that you did, or Mary, as you were obviously actively in research as well. Um, have you gotten any insights through your research into pharmacists who are was it in the community setting, but they're unhappy in their role? Why is it that they don't move? So that's something I don't, I, I'm not able to, the, the stats don't tell us and we didn't right. get that sort of information. Um, but I do think there's something, Christy made a, a, an interesting point, which mm -hmm. is, you know, there's there's this debate of people saying health mail is the problem, health mail isn't the problem. Sometimes it's around expectations and boundaries and protecting yourself. And going back to what Mary um, has said, it's not, the, and also what I'm hearing from Jody is pharmacists are going to make decisions more and more based on what they want for well-being. We're talking about burnout and, and 
and I suppose it's a somewhat, you know, ironically negative way and lack of positivity and optimism to be thinking about it that way, a better conversation for us to be having would be about well-being. But I think employee well-being and pharmacist well-being is really just going to be something that's really, really important um, uh, for, for people who want to get work. And, and I think there are lots of really nice pharmacies um, out there that people will work in where they get their cover and they, they get the kind of the support and they'll manage to retain their staff. Um, and I think people are just going to be looking for, for that more. But I didn't get any sense from the, um, the data, but what you you can see is that if community pharmacy has a lot of burnout, I think when you end up in that position of burnout, that's the point where it gets really difficult to, to make changes and do things because you're so depleted. So raising awareness of getting to it before you get to that point and looking after yourself and being able to make clear headed decisions um, is probably something that uh, is in the mix, but that's not necessarily um, something that came out from the research data, no. OK, and Katrina, if I can stay with you for a sec. So what do you see as people's expectations around this, you know, work life balance piece? I suppose more and more what I'm I'm seeing, uh, both anecdotally and, and also across the, the sector, people do want, as Mary said, a better work life balance to be able to have their free time to have some flexibility of hours. And that's not easy to achieve in a patient facing role and in community mm -hmm. or in hospital. So I, I get that. I understand it. Um, and it is a, a difficulty. And, you know, this isn't an easy thing to fix. If it were, I think um, it would be fixed because if there's one profession I know that will just set their mind to do things and deliver, it is pharmacy. So, you know, it, it, it the reason we're having a discussion about it is that it's not entirely easy and there's lots of things in the mix. COVID is in the mix. And I think Sean asked, you know, can you remove the COVID effect? And no, we can't. But I do know that some of the things that were issues now were always issues. And, and you know, COVID has exacerbated and uncovered them, but they're not necessarily new issues. It's just now a point of stress. They start to, to really show up as, as being difficulties. So we've got COVID. We've got newer generations with different expectations and we also have a more irritated population and people are more demanding patients are more demanding plus I think pharmacy has ended up in a place where it kept its doors open all the way through COVID when many others closed theirs so I think we've got a huge number of um, it's a perfect storm in some way but um, Deirdre is saying maybe the pharmacist role has become too patient focused and not enough staff to address this issue and, and not uh, focused with not enough staff to address this issue I, I think your staff and your team are everything you need to be able to work together and keep them um, working together in, in the interests of patients. And so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not coming here with necessarily any big reveal as to how to solve it, which might be really annoying for people. Um, but I think at least we're talking about it. And at least it isn't that people are staying in isolation and not saying how, you know, we can now see burnout is an issue within the profession. It's with an issue within healthcare professions in general. And we need to start thinking, what can we do? Is that at a personal level, organizational level or systematic level? It's probably all three. Yeah. Okay. Thank Mary, you all. You'd, you'd agree with that, is it? Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, we, we often use the analogy of the, the, coal the canary in the coal mine. And it's not about making more resilient canaries that go into that toxic environment. We have to address the, the structural issues as well within the workplace. But I agree, Katrina, I think it needs to be tackled on all levels. Um, and really back to that sphere of control, you know, what do you have within your remit to make sure that you can, um, you know, manage and maintain your own levels of health and well-being. I think that's a starting point. Okay, so it's an element of setting boundaries mm -hmm. for ourselves, and is it for our patients as well? Just reading through the comments that people yeah. were making about, you know, their engagement with patients and the demand placed on them in that patient-facing environment and. I suppose, how do we go about setting those kind of boundaries without pushing them back out the door quite physically? <laughs> Would you have any suggestions on how the pharmacists could maybe look to set boundaries within their own expectations of themselves, maybe in the role? 
Maybe yeah, I might ask you. Well, that. Katrina, do you want to take no, no, that no. first? Um, no, I think it, it, I know from from being in practice, it is incredibly difficult communication and empathy and, you know, meet uh, empathy both for yourself and self-care as well as for patients. And, and really, people are trying to do the very best that they can. So I do think there's an element about setting boundaries. We've seen some comments where some patients think it's okay to come in and expect everything to be ready straight away. And, and there is something around setting boundaries and it might feel terribly uncomfortable to say, actually your prescription won't be done for a half an hour because the pharmacist is taking a break, but it's trying to keep all the, the balls in the air. And it's difficult. I absolutely appreciate that it is, but um, having that com community and uh, that I think of the psychological safety in the workplace as a team trying to figure it out. It's not always one individual, but what can we do to try and protect the patients, but also protect ourselves? Because, you know, when you don't have anything left in the tank to give, you're just no good to anybody. So I know it feels counterintuitive, but really trying to make sure to... Um, look after yourself and then as logically as possible look at the various different things that do lie within your circle of control and sometimes you can have more control than you might think that would be my uh, parting words I'd, I'd be interested in Mary and Jody as well as the the final comments yeah absolutely um and I do think there is a correlation between, you know, people who have very high levels of empathy and that sense of sort of serving others. Um, and if we don't have that self-care, self-compassion first, um, that we are at risk of burnout if we're just constantly, as you said, you know, giving and serving, but actually not asserting our own needs and, and, and managing our own self-care. And I just I think Siobhan has made a really insightful comment in the chat where, you know, one person can set the tone in the pharmacy. And that speaks to Siobhan, that emotional contagion as well that having, you know, a positive um, work environment and, you know, managing if there is um, one person that is creating quite a negative um, tone within the team to, to really keep a close eye on that. Excellent. Thank you. Jodie, any parting words from your perspective and your role? Yeah, I think the boundaries is, like, like we were saying, really important. Um, I definitely... I don't know. I don't. I don't know what I'm trying to say. I don't have any. I don't have any problem disappointing somebody by not having it ready immediately. I'm okay with saying, Do you know what, that's going to be 45 minutes, and if they're not entirely happy about it, I go, that's how long it's going to take. You can wait, or you can call back. And I think those boundaries are really important. And kind of once you start to set them, they do become a little bit easier. And it's definitely something that I think can have a knock-on effect because when we're all trying to work under that time pressure you know like every everybody feels that mm -hmm. um so I think all of those things um are really important and having everybody on board so yeah mm -hmm. I see reset on what the norm is in your exactly work yeah environment. you know I do think things like COVID for for me in, in my experience at that time we definitely kind of encouraged more people to phone in advance and give us more time and we sort of kind of changed the way everybody ordered their prescriptions and they kind of stayed that way then which was okay. nice I so it can be, yeah like it can be done that we can change patients expectations as well yeah. um so maybe recalibrate their expectations of how long it takes because nice. we all know it's that sure look you're just throwing a few pills in a box yeah and hundred other people <laughs> oh, ahead of <laughs> yeah yeah so um okay well there's a I suppose a few reflective thoughts for us all to think about there um we can definitely sit back after this take a moment and see what boundaries we can set in our own places of work in our own work environments that might support ourselves support our teams the people around us make sure that we enjoy the place we go to work every day so I'd like to thank our panel for sharing their learnings um, and their research with us. Um, it's much appreciated. I, I definitely need to sit and kind of <laughs> digest it a bit after that. Um, thank you all for dialing in. We do have a, a short survey. It's in the chat box there. If you would just take a few quick moments to complete it, we greatly appreciate it. And maybe if you can take that few moments 
after you dial off to quickly jump onto your IIOP um, e-portfolio and complete a quick reflective cycle and it might give you that headspace to kind of work through everything you've heard tonight as well um, and get something down on paper for yourself that you could look to work to in your own um, workspace through your CPD reflective cycle. So thank you all for dialing in. Um, we're taking a break now for the summer, um, and but we will be back um, in mid-September and we will send the usual out on Twitter and our usual um, social media handles to notify you when that event is coming up and hopefully we'll see you then and between now and then and Katrina and the rest of the team the IOP thank you very much enjoy the summer mind yourselves take some time and set some boundaries <laughs> all right thank you all for dialing in good night thanks everyone thank you